check this out. We are actually in Hogwarts Great Hall. It is incredible. And this is one of the world's biggest film stars. And she's in my arms. I've dreamt of being in this position. Isn't she gorgeous? You know what they say about us Brits? We love our animals more than we love people. So, whilst they're filming the fourth and latest film in the series, The Goblet of Fire, we've come down to meet some of the more unusual stars of the show. We'll be taking a look at a whole host of animals, from Hagrid's dog Fang to the spooky ravens and bats that inhabit Hogwarts School. No, of course. We couldn't forget about you, Hedwig, could we? The Harry Potter films are jam-packed with all sorts of animals. Nearly every scene has some fur or feather in it. And of course, all the inhabitants of Hogwarts have their own special pet, including Emma Watson, who plays Hermione. It took me three films to get my own animal, and when I did, I was so, I was so chuffed. Rupert and Dan gave me a lot of grief about, about my cat, Crookshanks, because it looks like he's been uh, smacked in the face with a pan. He's got a completely flat face. It's not a cat, it's a cartoon of a cat. But I love, I love her. She's so, so cute and so fluffy, and love her. Going to Hogwarts means you don't always get something cute and fluffy. I don't mind having a toad, actually. I, I know a few of my neighbours um, where I live have ponds in their gardens, and they have, like, frogs and toads in there, so I'm quite used to them. When I was a kid, I used to always go around there, so, yeah, it was quite cool to get a toad, I guess. Not all actors are as happy as Matthew to work with animals. For a shot, all you want is you want the animal to know exactly what it has to do and to do it. Uh, because if the animals get off script, you're in real trouble. Ask me to remind you. Do you know what I mean? Because then you do 20 takes and they'll print the one that the animal got it right, even if you were rubbish. That's, that's why actors don't like working with animals. A challenge for some, but at times, director Mike Newell finds the animals no worse than the actors. That's it. I think the worst thing that we had to do was to get an owl to peck Dan's hand. And that took, I don't know, that took about 25 takes, something like that. But then, honestly, you know, a big star can take you 25 takes. <laughs> Just like any film stars, these animals require a lot of pampering, training and attention. Most of the Harry Potter animals live on set and are looked after 24 hours a day by Gary Giroux and his team of helpers. I have probably the greatest group of animal trainers that have ever been put together. For the staff, it's a full-time job. There's 150 animals in the compound uh, and so when Harry Potter is down, there's always staff here continually. 365 days a year. 150 animals need a lot of care. Every day they're cleaned, weighed and exercised even before the training begins. The trainers get a daily call sheet which tells them what animals will be required and those animals have to be fully trained and ready for their part. Keeping an eye on them all is Janice Caputo from American Humane, an animal welfare organisation. I'm here to make sure that there are no problems with uh, sets or individuals or conduct or noise or sound or any of those things while an animal is in action. In the event that something were to happen, then I can stop the filming at that position. But where do you find animals that are used to life on a film set? Are they bred specifically for their roles in Harry Potter? We don't do any breeding. We, don't, we try not to bring anything into this, into this world specifically for film work or for our company. We uh, strive to get animals that are already born, raised by parents, um, but young, um, impressionable and can learn quickly in this new environment and make this their home. Now, one of the biggest scenes for the animals in the Goblet of Fire takes place in the Owlery, and it's also a huge scene for Harry as well. Bit of a plot giveaway here, put your fingers in your ears if you don't want to listen. He has to ask someone on a date. I know. Hedwig was furious. I was just wondering if maybe he wanted to go to the ball with me. Shooting a scene like this is very complicated. Harry not only has to get romantic, but he has to do it in front of 68 owls trained to stay very still on their perches. So Simon, we're about to do this, this big scene yeah. here in the album, which you are solely responsible for. <laughs> yes. <laughs> do you, obviously the birds have been brilliantly trained, but do you get nervous? Oh, yeah, she always wants to make sure, because, of course, as they say, don't work with animals and children. <laughs> so what potentially could go wrong? Uh, they can jump off their perches, like the barn owl here can disappear in, into the back of the box under, under these bright lights. Whereabouts are you when they're filming? Are you very close to hand? Yes, we're just off shot, just in case anything, uh, anything jumps out or jumps to its perch, we can then reset it. It might look easy to sit on a perch, but it's taken months to train each owl to stay put. Gary, how do you go about getting them to sit so still? 
first first challenge, of course, is is uh, acclimating the birds to the environment. If they're comfortable in the environment, and if they don't have a, a food drive that's asking them to go somewhere else, pretty much all they have in their interest is to sit there. So the boys spent two months acclimating them to the stage environment and to their little apartments. So a little bit of food, a little bit of atmosphere, and they're happy. They are. We feed and exercise them first, and then it's time to nap in the apartments. Now, for filming in the owlery, where all the owls are used, it's absolutely covered in owl poo. It is. It's pretty much about poo. <laughs> <laughs> is this the usual amounts that you'd get in an owlery? Uh, yes. Obviously, if nobody cleans them up. And so we always wondered why, because especially this being Hogwarts, why can't they just wave a wand and clear it out? <laughs> I imagine the art department have come down and looked at what owl poo actually looks like. Yes, they came down, had a look to see how it falls, see what colour it is. Luckily, they haven't reproduced the smell. <laughs> is it quite a bad smell, usually? Yeah, I mean, obviously our birds don't get this bad, because we clean them every day. Of course. But yes, obviously, like anything, if it's left, it looks good smell. Have you found that the, the actors working with the animals have got really good at sort of coping with how the animals Oh, yes, the they're quite happy to, to be in the environment with the birds. They're not worried about it. Yeah, they, they cope with it very well. Daniel Radcliffe, who plays Harry Potter, does a lot of scenes with his rather special owl, Hedwig. There's basically one Hedwig per film. Like, the last one was Gizmo, and now he's been retired, and now we have Sprout playing Hedwig. So Sprout's Hedwig this time around? Sprout's Hedwig this time around, but Gizmo was like, me and Gizmo had a thing going, and we were cool, we were friends. <laughs> and because Sprout was really a bit of a drama queen. <laughs> and he would kind of sit there, and when he wasn't being used, you could look down, and he was going... Oh, this is kind of giving evil eye. Gizmo the evil eye. Really? And he was a jealous owl, but now he's kind of come into his prime and he's relaxed a bit. He's much less neurotic as an owl actor. Hedwig, like all the owls, has had to learn a lot of tricks. Dave, that is a fantastic trick. How on earth do you teach the owls <laughs> to not only grab hold of a bit of mail in a post, and, and, but then to let go of it? It's a very long process. It takes about three months to actually finish training it. We train them to first stay and learn to stay on books and different objects and on tables. And we teach them the clicker in the bowl. So they have to learn that the food is coming from someplace else other than from the ground. So it starts off with a perch, hand in the letter, hand in the letter. And when they start dropping it, you click them and pay them for them. Then you have to teach them this part of it, which is carry it. It's right there, my friend. I understand that some of the owls pick it up quicker than others. Yeah, we found through the training process is that the little guys pick it up better than the big guys do. The big guys are more greedier, so when they grab something, they really want to hold on to it. And a lot of times we could be training them, they could be flying really great back and forth to us with the letters, and then one time they'll just pick it up, take it, dive into a corner, and try to shred it as quickly as they can. And would you say that owls have been some of the hardest animals that you've had These to? These are the toughest. This has been the biggest challenge of my career. Like you say, you spend months and months working on these tricks. When eventually they work and they work on camera, that must be such a great feeling. It's a wonderful feeling, yeah. Just this little retrieve right here is a wonderful feeling. <laughs> <laughs> Contrary to popular belief, it's not the owls that are the bright birds on the block. That prize goes to the crows and the ravens. Um, basically, what we just taught them is a little pattern to stay on the chair, Come over to a mark, stay. Now I'm just going to ask him to cough first, get his attention. Cough. <coughs> Hit that chair. Hit it. Right there. Stay. <coughs> Very good. Stay. Basically, if you're having a really bad day on set, uh, you always take out your crow or your raven because they always make you look really good. <coughs> Not a moment to go. Hagrid, at Robbie Coltrane, spends a lot of time filming with the ravens and crows, but his closest <coughs> companion is Fang. With Fang, obviously, I had to spend some time with him so he got used to me. I noticed in your list of questions it said, did it have to get used to your smell? So listen, I had to get used to its smell, mate. <laughs> Fang, or Monkey as he's known, is trained by Jules. How difficult has it been to train him up? Monkey came to me from a rescue and he was absolutely starving when I got him. Um, so he hadn't had a good start to life. So it took um, sort of two or three months of me just feeding him up, getting him fit, bonding with him. Mm so he could trust me, um, and then I started training him. We try as hard as we can to acquire animals from rescue um, homes. We find they're, they're really the best animals, they're, they're worldly, um, um, and they, they care about the attention more since they've been deprived. And he's a Neapolitan Mastiff? Yeah. Did you know much about them? I didn't know anything about them at all when the uh, breed was cast, so I had to do a lot of research and learn that they are very strong willed, <laughs> um, obviously you get very, very big. Yeah. Do not make a good family pet at all. I mean, the hunting dogs originally, they got gnashes on them like sharks. 
you certainly wouldn't like to fall out with one. Despite ferocious gnashes, Fang spends a lot of time in the films looking afraid. So um, what we do for that is we teach them to back up. Hey, back, 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 head, stay, head, stay. One of the most important things to learn is to stand on a mark. <laughs> we start off with a really big mark and then once we've finished and are ready to go on set, they end up with a tiny piece of wood or a leaf or something like that. Because they'll have a stage direction, won't they? They'll say, Fang walks in, finds a way, stops. Right. OK, like that's what it was saying in the script, and you've got to be able to get Fang to walk exactly, in, stop yeah. exactly where he needs to stop. Mm -hmm. Go, Mark. Mark. Good. Good. Wow. Good boy. Neapolitan Mastiffs can be quite protective, as Daniel found when filming The Chamber of Secrets. One of the dogs, which was um, playing Fang, because there were about four or five dogs that played Fang, um, and one of them was called Bella. And this one uh, got really protective of me. We were doing one of the scenes where, with Aragog, the spider, and it was a huge animatronic spider, and every time it came up over the hill, the dog ran out in front of me. Which was really cool, because I'm like, yes, I am the master of the dogs. <laughs> but, um, but we had to do so many, so many takes of it, because oh. simply we wanted the dog to stay there, and we had to change dog. But it was, it was, and he was just it, trying it was to protect fantastic. you. Yeah, and I, found, I, I was like, no, don't change. I'm quite, I'm quite moved. <laughs> In the Goblet of Fire, there's a new owl on the block, and it belongs to Sirius Black. The director wanted a black owl, but they don't exist. So Gary and the team put their heads together and came up with a solution. They decided to change the colour of one of their owls. We only do it once. Um, we have to make sure they stay out of the rain because it does wash off. It's not a permanent dye. It might be a non-toxic organic vegetable colouring, but does the owl mind? No, she doesn't mind at all. No, because she's hand-raised and she's been with us for four and a half years, she just, she just um, gets accustomed to everything that we do. It's like children that are given these uh, little tattoos that you're able to put little vegetable dye tattoo. It, it has the same thing. It's the same methodology. But would you believe it? It's not just the owls that need makeup. Join us after the break to find out who has their own line in eyeshadow. Make me look expensive, darling. Hi, welcome back. We're behind the scenes at Leavesden Studios where they're making the latest Harry Potter film, The Goblet of Fire. But the movie stars we're interested in are the furry kind. In this movie, Ron's got himself a new pet, an owl by the name of Pigwidgeon. We've managed to grab Rupert off set to introduce us to your new owl. Yep, this is uh, Ron's new pet, cos uh, I'm the third one. Scabber, I lost Scabbers cos like, he was the... A baddie, so, uh, yeah, this is my new pet. We're all gonna miss Scabbers, cos cos Ron and Scabbers were such great partners in crime. Yeah, I did I did like Scabbers, yeah, he was, he was quite fun to uh, work with him. We had working Scabbers, which actually the running Scabbers, and we also had holding Scabbers, and that Ron actually held um, and spent time with during the day. In the third film, we taught him to run down a piano when Sirius Black and uh, another one of the characters are trying to zap him with their wands. <laughs> Scabbers was very easy to train. The hardest part about uh, working with Scabbers was putting his makeup on. That looked more like Peter Pettigrew. So we put ear tufts on him. Little, we had little tufts of hair made, made for him. We had tufts of hair made for his body. Those little pieces of hair that we actually shaved on his body to make him look like he was bald. But Scabbers isn't the only animal to have a makeover. Jules, what's going on? Eyeshadow for a cat. Well, um, obviously the cats in real life are, are very well groomed. Yeah. Um, but the character Crookshanks has to look all manky. To give Crookshanks that manky look, they mix a non-toxic cream with eyeshadow and smear it under his eyes. And obviously, when we put it on, we're, we're very careful not to get too close to the eye. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but even if it did a little bit did go in his eyes, it wouldn't be a problem. But the makeover doesn't stop there. For this cat, it's the full body treatment. This is fur that I collected um, from the cats when I groom them. I keep their undercoat, and we make little fur balls. So we can quite clearly see these pads, but I imagine from afar, you can't see it at all. 
Yep. Once he's finished, then um, he has just big clumps and he just looks like a manky street cat. Ah, um, okay. Obviously, we can't keep them like that and wouldn't want to. So, no, 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 of course. So we designed a way of... And, and, and the cat's quite happy to have these things yeah, put into its fur? Yeah, he likes any attention, this one. Even Scabbers enjoyed himself. You know the Egyptians used to wash a cat? Yeah, along with a dung beetle. He's looking suitably mankified, but let me tell you a little secret about Crookshanks. In fact, there isn't just one cat, there are three. They're all trained to do different things. Um, like, one of them can climb up the curtains. Another one, if, like, if you put a mark down, will go to it. Um, Another cat will, um, it's just a really good one for holding and doesn't mind being stroked and cuddled and they've all got different, different things they can do. Now obviously we're on a set in a minute and you can hear people banging away in the background and it must be a real distraction for the cats and I would have thought it would be much harder to train the cats up than it is the dogs, for example. The key behind a really good film cat is a really bold cat and a really greedy cat, <laughs> because then they sort of forget what's going on. But we very, very, very carefully introduce them to this kind of environment. It's so important that you do that slowly, because if they do get afraid, then you'll never get them working. A trained cat. Hard to believe, but it's amazing what Jules can get them to do. Uh, one of the most important things with all the animals is teaching them to stay. So if there's a lot of dialogue in the scene, um, they just have to stay in the place. So we start off with, um, hey, Cracker Jack, sit, sit, stay, good, lie down, good, stay, good, stay. Okay, go Mark, go Mark, kitty, Mark, stay. Good. Good. And is that, Jules, is that clicker? Is that the same sort of thing you use when you're training owls and dogs? And... Yeah, I mean, I don't use the um, a clicker for the dogs, but it's just a bridge that means good and the food's coming to you. If someone wanted to teach their cat at home a trick, what would be a really simple trick? Because I have never known a cat to do anything it doesn't want to do. Dogs have owners, cats have staff, right? Probably the easiest thing is sit, because you can just, you can just do that out with the food. Cracker Jack, sit, sit, stay, good. Something else we teach them is a buzzer, so they hear a buzz, and that's where they, where the food is. So if we want them to say to run up the stairs, then we'll have a trainer at the top of the stairs with a buzzer. Um, that's pretty simple to teach them. And when they get to the buzz, they get some food? Yeah. There's going to be kids all around the country with buzzers down the road, <laughs> cats running around trying to find them. <laughs> And there's another furry creature running around in the Goblet of Fire, a ferret. Now, Dave, why does a ferret appear in this film? Well, there's a scene in the film where Mad-Eye Moody turns Malfoy into a ferret and then controls him by his wand. And we had to teach him to do uh, different types of behaviors um, by target training. Okay. And basically what target training is, is Hello. this little ping pong ball. Every time he touches the ping pong ball, we gave him a click and we gave him a little bit of food. Okay. All right, so then what we do is we put him down on the ground. As you go ahead, go ahead and put him right down there. There you go, let him see this. And he's gonna go like this. He's gonna see that, he's gonna turn, turn, turn. <laughs> so how far away could you get from the, from the ferret? We get about 10 feet away and kill him. And he'd still learn to go he around He still around. keeps going around. He hears the tone of our voice and he just starts seeing the hand motion of the, the ping pong ball. It's also another scene where he actually has to, um, we have to build him a harness, and he actually flies down and goes inside the pants. Goes inside whose pants? It goes inside his crab's pants. <laughs> so the ferret goes inside one of the actor's pants? Yep, goes in crab's pants. Then Goyle comes over and tries to take him out, acts like the ferret bites him. The ferret then pops up and looks over his belt loop and then drops down and runs out of the frame. The, the most difficult thing there was not that you could get the ferret to do it, you can perfectly easily get a ferret to do it. A ferret wants to do it. Um, but whether you can find the boy who will, um, who will be able to act adequately with a ferret down his trousers. And miraculously enough, this boy could. But with all these animals on set, there are sometimes little accidents. A few times on the third one, uh, the rat pooed on me. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not just the rats that have problems with their toilet training. He's weighed on me a couple of times, and um, when they took him away from me and gave him back, he did the exact same thing. If you think that's bad, you should try filming with bats. We have bats in the scene in the third film, and they pee and fly. At the same time? Yeah. The bats can also get rather confused with their stage directions. In Hagrid's hut. 
Alfonso Cuaron said, look, this guy, this man, he's supposed to be in love with animals. I don't see any. So he filled the whole hut with them one day. They actually taught us what we can do and what we can't do with them. Um, the, the part that we were having a problem with for the, the movie was we were training to fly to a perch. What we realized is if we just took them and tossed them out in the shot and ducked out of the way, they'd try to find us and they'd fly around the room a couple of times and then come back and land on us. Which if you watch the third film, you would see in Hagrid's hut, the bats are actually flying around looking for us, looking for a place to land. The camera was moving and I'm, I'm moving around like this with, with a camera to look out the window and say something. And just in my peripheral vision, I see this fruit bat stick straight onto the side man's face. It's one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. Funny it may be, but is working with animals in this way cruel? What we found over time is the animals that are happy in this environment um, love the work, they love the challenge, and most of all they love the, the connection and, the, and um, the relationship that's developed with the trainers. If we find something that isn't happy, in the, we don't push it, we don't force it, we don't insist that it happens, we, we put him back in a situation where he's comfortable. They have gone beyond, in some instance, the safety issues to make sure that there aren't any problems in the actual production. Whether it's teaching ferrets to chase balls or owls to deliver post, the animal trainers are a breed of their own. All the animal people are very happy. A lot of the other people, me included, are very grouchy quite a lot of the time. <laughs> but the animal people are happy, and I suppose, I don't know why. Most days we can't believe that people actually pay us to do this. I'm so lucky to have the job I have. It's, it's very, very hard to get into this industry. Well, I started very young. Um, I just had an interest in animals at a very young age. Did you start my training dogs or, I mean, how's I it? I actually went? had parrots. You had parrots? I had parrots and snakes, and I was kind of the weird kid on the block, you know, because all the weird things that I had. So what happens to the animals when it's time for them to retire? We try to have as many of the animals as possible live with the trainers in a home environment. The animals that work with us for a long project are, are animals that are dedicated to our business in this situation, stay with us forever. We've had the most fantastic time today, meeting these amazing animals, seeing the detail and the care that goes into training them up. It's just been absolutely awesome. I cannot wait to see this film, as I'm sure you guys can't either. Thank you.